There, we're now live and being recorded. So thank you all for, for joining us this evening for our United States of Hope Warrior Team Hunt program. Tonight, we're blessed to have uh, with us Jeff Dara, who's a, a retired Montana uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks game warden. And um, uh, he's kind enough to come and talk with us this evening about the uh, Montana game laws and, and regulations. And, and he's kind of an expert at that, having been on the enforcement side for a number of years. I'll let uh, Jeff tell you more about himself as, as we get going here. But um, just wanted to thank you for joining us, oh, Jeff. It's, it's great Thanks. to have you here with Thanks us again. Having. And uh, let me uh, do a little bit of um, there. All right. So All right. I'm going to hand it off to you, Jeff. OK, great. Thanks. Technology, isn't it great? We don't even have to meet with people anymore. <laughs> don't have to wear jeans anymore either. Just shirt, <laughs> pair of shorts. <laughs> anyway, thank you for uh, letting me talk at you tonight. Uh, my name's Jeff Dara. Um, started as a game warden in 1986 uh, here in, in Montana. Uh, actually started in Missoula and uh, was a game warden for nearly 27 years, but actually about 26 and a half. Um, I was the captain um, for region two, which is pretty much Western Montana for 14 years. I was in charge of the wardens here in this region. And, uh, but I'd also been stationed as a field warden in Missoula, um, Phillipsburg, Glasgow and Chinook. And I was a Sergeant in Butte. That was my first promotion, but a lot of people argue and saying being stationed in Butte's not a promotion. <laughs> but uh, I, I was a sergeant in Butte for seven years. Um, so I've kind of been all through the state uh, from the east to the west and uh, in between. Uh, Got to brag a little bit because I don't get to do it anymore. But uh, in 2010, I was the International Game Warden of the Year, um, presented to me by SCI. 2008, I was the Chiefs Game Warden of the Year in the state of Montana. 2004, I received a citation for bravery um, from the governor. And in 2002, uh, I led one of the largest uh, poaching cases, investigations in the state's history. And in 1989, I was a law enforcement officer of the year in Missoula County. Um, Kind of an icebreaker here. I, I saw this once and thought it was funny. Um, maybe you got to be a game warden to get it, but uh, sometimes someone unexpected comes into your life out of nowhere, makes your heart race, and changes you forever. We call these people game wardens. Uh, um, I've seen a lot of uh, faces with that oh shit look on it uh, numerous times when you sneak up behind people when they're thinking they're out there where nobody's at. Um, and there's no polite way to, other than maybe cough or sneeze or something, you know, let them know you're back there. Um, but I've scared a lot of people, not purposefully, but <laughs> um, this is me in my last patrol. And this is just kind of an example of that. Uh, there's a high country lake called Medicine Lake. And there's a stream that cutthroat trout spawn in. And uh, because it's so high, their spawning season runs a little later than other places. So it traditionally doesn't open to fishing until July 1st. And it's kind of an out of the way place. It's not something you drive to with a vehicle and get out and fish. You really have to either hike or use an ATV to get back in there. So you know what your destination is and you know what the rules are and you're, I would always go there um, before the opener and spend several days up there. And every year um, we would catch people in that creek uh, taking fish illegally. So um, those kinds of contacts were very valuable as a game warden. Um, you could stay on a, a big lake and check 100 people in a day, or you could go to one of those out of the way places and check somebody doing something wrong. And, the word would get out fast that uh, the game warden had been there. So hopefully that would protect fish in the future. 
just wildlife law in general, um, you know, I, I, I think there's always been kind of a, a mystique around game wardens in that game wardens are bad or it's us versus the game warden or the game warden makes all the rules and he's just a jerk. <laughs> uh, I've heard a lot of that, you know, but give a little history um, as early as John Quincy Adams, just the sixth president of the United States, in 1788, he said, it is certain that where there are no game laws, there never is any game, and that without game laws, very few individuals will enjoy the privilege of hunting or eating venison. And so what that says is over 200 years ago, um, when our country was relatively new, we knew that we could out, you know, strip the game if we didn't have some rules to go by. Um, and that I've seen that even today, you know, there are a lot of species, um, you know, the bison were nearly wiped out. At one time there were 30 million, estimated that there were 30 million bison left or in, in America. And that number was taken down to less than 1000 bison. Um, Actually, it was closer to a hundred. Um, so, and they weren't even harvested for the meat. They were harvested for the hides and the tongues. So that's an example of a species that we nearly wiped out. Um, and early on, uh, we had conservation heroes. You know, today uh, the NGOs and the special interest groups really—it's uh, hard to keep up with them. Uh, I believe when I was a captain, we had a list of uh, uh, NGOs and conservation groups in, in just our region, and it was uh, nearly a hundred. So, and every, so what that means is everybody wants a seat at the table and wants to put in their opinion about their wildlife, and that's the way it should be. But it becomes difficult sometimes to manage wildlife when there are so many opinions. Um, Theodore Roosevelt was one of these first heroes. We've all heard of him. Um, he actually was responsible for protecting 230 million acres of land, uh, Yellowstone Park. John Muir, father of the national parks, also was the founder of the Sierra Club, which today is not the same Sierra Club it was uh, when John Muir founded it uh, and a writer. Gifford Pinchot, he was the first head of the US Forest Service, also very active uh, in, in legislature. George Bird Grinnell, uh, outdoor writer, worked on legislation um, to protect the American bison. So I guess in general what I'm saying is wildlife has always been on the radar of the citizens of this country. And it means a lot to all of us, uh, whether we hunt or not. Um, I think hunters have a, have a, a different relationship with it than maybe non-hunters, but in 1865, um, the first territorial legislation passed its first game laws. So before Montana was even a state, we had a game law uh, and we started making game laws. Um, the first game law in the state of Montana was the only way you could take a trout was limited to a pole, a hook, and a line. And uh, how simple that would be if you would look at today's fishing regulations <laughs> and to see how complicated they are. Um, and all you have to do is look at region two and say, I can keep fish here, I can't keep fish here, I can use this, and uh, you know, I can't use this lure, and I can use this lure. And, uh, this isn't open to keep fish. So I've had a lot of people tell me over the years that they just quit fishing in general because the fishing rules were so complicated that they, they, they um, just give up. And that's too bad. And that's what happens when there are a lot of special interests. Hold on, Jeff. Yep. I, uh, I think I forgot to share our screen. Oh, okay. One second here. Hi, Christina. Oh, so they didn't see any of those slides? They didn't see any of that. <laughs> so we got to start all over. Well, Jeff. what you can do is just go through <laughs> them fast. Yeah, yeah I can do that. Back I'm sorry I'm about sorry that. that guy. Yeah. Let's see. How many slides into it are you? No, we're, not, we're, we're not very far into okay. it. But. No, it's eight slides. We'll go up and over. 
it's not going there. There we go. Good catch, Steve. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff, for your flexibility. No, 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 that's all right. I wouldn't have saw it because Somebody I don't have my glasses me. on. So, you, yeah, this, this, this was just the uh, yeah. uh, about me slide. We don't need to talk about that. Uh, that was the sometimes someone unexpected comes into your life out of nowhere, makes your heart race and changes you forever. You might think that might be your uh, your first girlfriend or boyfriend, but <laughs> nope, it's game warden does that to you. And this was me when I was talking about the high mountain lake, um, you know, and it was like, how did you get that picture of you working that lake? There was actually a news, uh, a writer, outdoor writer that came up and spent a day with me and he took the picture. So, um, and this is John Quincy Adams and him basically saying without game laws, um, there will be, there will be very few game and people won't be able to eat venison. And we all know that uh, on our level, if we have a, a hunting spot and we tell people about it uh, in a matter of a year or two, it's no longer your secret hunting spot. <laughs> we, 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 <laughs> we talk about commercial hunting impact. Honey yeah, hole. yeah, exactly. Honey hole is no longer. Um, commercial hunting impact, we talked about bison and how market hunting nearly wiped out the bison. And, uh, and we talked about uh, the first conservation heroes that really stepped up and set kind of the pattern for even us today. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, John Muir, Gifford Pinchot, George Bird Grinnell. And those definitely aren't all of them, but those are some of the big names, uh, the heavy hitters for sure. Um, in 1865, Montana wasn't a state yet, but the uh, legislature passed uh, the first game law, which basically said the only legal means to take a trout in Montana was with a pole, hook, and a line. Uh, the regulations are much more complicated than that now. In 1889, it was this, we're, we're up to date now here. We're right on with the right slides, and I haven't talked about these yet. In 1889, uh, the same year Montana gained statehood, the le legislature passed a law that at the time there were only 24 counties they, that allowed these counties to hire a game warden. Well, by 1901, um, you know, 12 years later, I think there were only uh, like four, four counties that had hired a game warden. So it was fairly obvious that um, that wasn't going to happen unless the state ran the program. So by 1901, uh, the state created the Montana Fish and Game Department, and the first employee was a state game warden named W.F. Scott. And uh, what a warden district he had, um, the state of Montana. Um, right. Yeah, that's a, a painting. Buckeye it's than Germany. Yeah, Buckeye Blake painted it. So... W.F. Buckeye? Buck, Buckeye Blake painted that uh, okay. picture. W.F. Scott was the, the warden. Uh, his orders were to enforce the law without fear or favor and do everything in your power to inform and enlighten people regarding game protection and game laws in Montana. Um, pretty simple task. Um, not really. <laughs> uh, enforce the law without fear or favor. Um, that's a tough one, um, for sure. I mean, not the favor part, but without fear. Uh, I can only imagine riding into camps by yourself with no backup. But anyway, it didn't take long. He hired, I think, seven wardens within the next year. And uh, so now we're going to talk about laws and regulations and how they happen. You know, how 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 did they happen? You know, how do they how are they created? Is it the game warden sitting in his truck, deciding how can I be hook and crook and grab people and ruin their day? No, it's not that. Uh, you know, laws and statutes are created by legislature. Um, in many ways, they happen. Some are good and some aren't. And uh, Sam here is very active in legislature and, and uh, 
on many fronts and some of the fronts he's active on are, are game laws and changes to those game laws. Uh, we'll talk more about some of those. Um, laws can come from a legislator listening to his constituency, special interest groups, or a direct result of an enforcement action or the request of the department. And there's probably nothing more contentious in the Montana legislature than fish, fish wildlife and parks law. Um, it's very, very contentious. And it's, it, it, it pits, sometimes it pits hunters against each other. It pits bow hunters against gun hunters. It pits uh, long range shooters from muzzleloader, muzzleloader hunters. Um, you know, it'll pit fishermen against each other. There's the fly fisherman that's the purest and then the guy that just likes to hunk a, a thing of worms and take fish home and eat them. So sometimes we're our own worst enemy, but sometimes it's, a, in Montana, it's big in one, one sense, but in another sense, it's small. And what I mean by small is a game warden can have a contact and write somebody a ticket in Baker, Montana. In Baker, Montana, and... The next day, the word is in Missoula, Montana, that a game warden did such and such. Well, it's like any rumor or any story that can change a lot from the time it happened to when it gets to here. But generally what happens is, is somebody is not happy or they're upset the way the law was enforced or that they got a ticket and they'll bend the ear of a legislator and they'll just say, we'll change that law. And believe it or not, it is that simple sometimes. And a lot of times FWP spends more time fighting legislation than they do creating legislation. And uh, I guess some examples of that were um, for many years, we, we fought the bill to make suppressors and silencers legal in, in the state of Montana. And as a game warden, we just saw no no value in that in other than for criminal activity and you know we brought ranchers in and I, we brought in silencers and suppressors that we seized and told the poaching stories behind them and it was good enough to fend off that legislation for uh about four or five sessions but finally these suppressors and silencers are started being used in so many other states that it, we could tell we were losing the war. And it was just, well, we'll give up on that one and not fight it anymore. So what were the, what were some of the justifications that they would give you know, in favor of suppressors? A lot of it was uh, for hearing protection. You know, have major hearing yeah, loss. Yes, have hearing loss or hearing protection. And, you know, and, and sometimes, from our perspective, you would just think of how a bad guy could misuse something. And um, generally, I hate to say it, a lot of laws are created because a few people did a few, uh, a few bad things. And the majority of the, of the people that would use it would never do anything wrong. And that's sad to say, that's the way a lot of law is. Um, so anyway, those are some ways that uh, laws can be um, started or bills can be started. Uh, regulations, you might say, well, what's the difference between a law or a statute and a regulation? A regulation is put into place by uh, Fish Wildlife Commission. It, it doesn't have to go through the legislative process. And generally a regulation is like uh, a size limit or a brow time bull area versus a any bull area. Um, it, it's something that the commission has the authority to pass. Now, it, it still has to have public comment, it has to go through all the processes and what have you, um, but it doesn't have to go through the same process a law does. And it's easier to change a regulation than it is to change a statute. So the, the seasons, the number of permits in right. an area. Right, those are all set by the regulation yeah. process. So. It, Federal laws, we'll discuss that a little bit more, but there are federal laws that uh, state game wardens in Montana enforce as well. Just a, a, a quick example is uh, 
the Migratory Bird Act is a federal law, and that's what tells you that you can only shoot steel shot in your shotgun. You can only have three shells in your shotgun, and there are shooting hours and, and limits on the waterfowls. So those are federal laws that the states adopt um, each year. Let's see, legislature, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I, I put some legislature slides in here. Um, every session causes for change in the management of our natural resources. And now that the session is over, you know, Montana only has a session every two years, not every year. So you really have to kind of follow the rules and the regulations because they change uh, sometimes greatly. And in this session, they did that. And it's because, truly it's because of politics. Um, for uh, 16 years, there was um, Democrats in control pretty much, and, and, and now there's a Republicans in control. And I'm not saying I'm in favor of one or the other. I'm just saying that the, the line of thinking is different, even into the wildlife things uh, that pass or don't pass. Um, so if, if you are, um, for example, a person that don't think wolves should be hunted, this was a very bad session for you because the uh, Republicans passed a lot of wolf hunting bills this session. And so other things that can happen, uh, my whole game warden career, you could not hunt bears with the use of dogs. Um, that's changed. Um, you're going to be able to hunt bears with the use of hounds. Um, so how long that stays that way, who knows? But I guess what I'm trying to say is laws change. and People can, uh, you know, as a game warden, I would see that where you would talk to somebody and you'd say, hey, do you know what the limit is here? They'd look at you and say, well, isn't it 10 pounds of fish? 10 pounds of fish? I've been a game warden for 25 years <laughs> and I have never heard that regulation, you know? So at one time there must have been a regulation that said you could do that. But anyway, it's important that um, you follow this and, and at least if you don't follow the legislature, go through the regs every year, the hunting regs or proclamation that the department puts out, and they'll generally highlight what's new. Um, a, friend, a friend of mine got pinched by that a number of years ago. Bear season used to open in the fall with archery season. Mm -hmm. And so my friend shoots a bear with his bow on opening day of archery season, that same bear had been coming into his trash cans for, for two weeks, well, more than that, all summer, and he shoots this bear on opening day of archery season. Goes to take the bear into the, the, the meat, into the, the meat, pro, the butcher, he goes, you can't shoot bear yet. And he's like, oh no. So he calls up the, the Fish and Wildlife, they send out a game warden to investigate. And they said, they told him, you're going to get a ticket. Had you called us and told us you had a problem bear, we would have come out here and taken care of it for you. But um, they took his bear, they wrote him a ticket, and he paid a relatively small fine. But, uh, you know, it, that law snuck up on him. And, you know, he hadn't paid attention to those rights the way he should have. And I will say, and I think it's somewhere else in this in this uh, slide series, is uh, game wardens and fish, wildlife, and parks are are very lenient um, in the fact that whenever there's a major law change, generally from Helena, we'll get the edict to educate uh, the first year. You know, unless it's just a blatant and there's mitigating circumstances that says, no, this is different. But uh, on, the on the story that um, you just heard about the bear, uh, you know, if that was the first year, um, generally, you know, if there was a citation issue, it would have been like a commission rule regulation citation. But um, the average game warden each year writes about 50 citations a year. Um, and when you break that down by month and, and there are seasonal things that they do, uh, everything from enforced snowmobile registration 
to boat decals and boat licensing, the life jacket enforcement to uh, fishing and then hunting, um, you know, they really don't write very many violations. Uh, they give generally as many written warnings as they do citations. Even now it's the, the boat inspection for the, uh, what's the mall? Uh, oh, the muscles. Muscle, muscle, muscle. Yeah. Zebra muscles. Zebra muscles, yeah. yeah. There's probably more tickets written for that, that alone. People trying to, forgetting, not knowing they need to stop. Yeah. And, that, and that's not a new, a new thing no. now. So people that should be educated. People should, like, should know. Really I really mean, emphasize. But even uh, if you have a paddleboard. Yeah. The paddleboard yeah. is even, and I think that's what catches a lot of folks yeah. off guard. It's not a boat, yeah. so it's weak. It's, but if your inner tubes are, you should check them too. This was, this was another uh, proposed change that I know Sam was, was uh, in, kind of made comment on and involved with. Let me just say something there real quick, if sure. I could, just to add on to what you said. Sure. What I learned is Jeff is 100% right. This is Sam Redfern with the Warrior Hunt Program. And I know Jeff uh, wants to get through this, but I, I love the interactive part with yeah. Jeff. Um, I got humbled this session because, you know, I think some of us went in there with the mentality of Republican governor, Republican legislature, and not taking sides, like you said. It's just yeah. different, yeah. different mindsets. Yep thinking that, uh, you know, this this would be a, a lot of change or this would be a lot of change. The biggest thing I learned this session is don't make, be careful with your words in the hunting world because I got a little loose at times mm -hmm. and it came back to bite me uh, where you just, it's a still a big city state. In, in other words, it's one big town, right? Montana. Yeah. Yeah. And you want to have your friends still with you on other things, right? Right. right. So right. I, I, I want to just tell everybody, I learned a lot. It humbled me. And Jeff is 100% right that even more than religion or politics, fish and game seems to be the hottest issue in the legislature. It's just so big. Yeah. And so it shows me that the game wardens have a lot of... Um, Pressure, it's important we support game wardens because they're, they're, the laws are changing. It's not their their fault. They've got to enforce the law. Right. Yep, exactly. And, Sorry, just one thing. I don't always, yeah. you know, you know, I've been retired now for nine years, but uh, game wardens don't always agree with, with the laws that are passed. Uh, you know, absolutely. You know, they're at the things that, you know, that change and, uh, You've done it the same way for 20 years, and then all of a sudden it changes. It's really hard to get out of that mindset into, well, that's not the way you're supposed to do it. Um, so anyway, all of this is to kind of let you know that things do change and kind of why it changes. Um, you know, um, this I was would imagine that that just because Christina's in Georgia and right. we have other warrior hunters in different states. Yeah. That, that that's similar in other states. Oh, it? yeah, kind of yeah, that, yeah. That you know, and, and, and uh, non-residents will move to Montana or come here to hunt yeah. and they'll read our regulations and they'll just almost always say, oh, they're so complicated. Well, if you go to their state and look at their regulations, it's like, whoa, you're like, you're, you're way more complicated <laughs> than we are, you know. Um, and this is just another uh, slide on the wolves. There were a, a bunch of wolf bills. Um, probably the biggest one that I think that will have maybe the biggest impact is the FWM4 bill. And what that is, is it, it's a way for, it made it legal to reimburse wolf hunters for their expenses and costs for hunting wolves. Um, and the way it works is, is you have to become a member of this FWM4 group and pay dues and the money goes into this pot and if you save your receipts for like gas and bullets and you know whatever expenses you have, you can turn it in and then there's a board that will decide how much of a check you will get. Um, and it's basically, Idaho has been doing it for a while and uh, because people buy, don't, you know, not a lot of people wanna go hunt a wolf, you know, I think a lot of guys are like me, they'll buy a wolf tag and put it in their pocket just in case they run into a wolf. Mm -hmm. But then after big game season's over, they don't go really look for a wolf. That's me. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so it's like, 
uh, you know, so this is a way to get people more serious about hunting them. And, um, you know, we're over the number of wolves that are required to delist the wolves by a substantial amount. So in a lot of areas, wolf or elk populations and deer populations are suffering because of the number of wolves. So and certainly behaviors have been changed. Oh yeah. Where the herds are now hanging out in the low country all year. Yeah. Can I ask a question on that, Jim? Yeah. yeah. Not to get too yeah. far, yeah. but I just saw a study today. Have you seen this? Yeah. Where it said that, that uh, wolves reintroduced into an area will lower traffic collisions by 24%. You know, yeah, it's yeah, 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 you know, it's 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 I read that and I, and I started to laugh, you know, I was thinking, sure they do. Because there's less, there's less, <laughs> there's less, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, there you go, there's yeah, the answer. <laughs> yeah, numbers are a funny thing. The numbers are funny thing. Uh, FWP, this is a copy of the 2020 hunting regulations, uh, again, they, there's a change here. These regulations are approved by the five member commission each year. Well, this year there was a bill introduced in the legislature to change the number of commissioners from five to seven, which I think was a good idea. Is that a good move? Yeah, it's okay. a good move because it gives a, each individual uh, administrative region their own commissioner. And for example, when we'd have a commissioner here in the West, he'd have all of Missoula and Kalispell. So, I mean, that's a lot of area for that commissioner to have to listen to sportsmen and kind of have his uh, finger on the pulse of what's going on. This will make it a little bit easier. Um, so anyway, that did pass. And I think that's a good thing. It's always a good thing to have more input and more people thinking about it. Um, most common hunting violations, I'll talk about these. Trespass, um, there's... Uh, couple of different kinds of trespass. There's hunting big game without landowner's permission. Uh, and then there's criminal trespass. Uh, if you're going to get a trespass, you want that first one because it doesn't cost near as much as criminal trespass. <laughs> criminal trespass is when you cut a gate or cut a fence to get in on somebody's property. Um, you know, hunting without landowner permission can happen fairly easily in Montana because it's not the landowner's responsibility to, to mark or post its property with a sign or a fence. And in a lot of places, uh, there are no fences and there are no signs. So it's up to the hunter to know where he's at or she's at. Um, if you would step off the road and shoot an animal and the landowner came up and said, hey, this is my property, you could be in trouble. So very common. You got to experience that first violation a number of years ago. Okay. Uh, property. Uh, I worked for a timber company that then sold the land. Most of the land was managed wide open, just like Forest Service. But the ranch had kept one section for their guys to hunt on. But they didn't. Well, it was my responsibility to know that, and I didn't call them to clarify. And I harvested an elk on their ranch, and. They came up and I was honest. It's like I knew exactly where I was. Right. And when I, I went in in the dark over this ridge and never went up down the road on the gate, you know, past the gate. But when we were coming out, I saw the gate. I was like, oh, no. This is all, all kinds of bad. <laughs> and, and it was. And, and the, the game warden that uh, came and met with us, um, you know, talked to the landowner. They, they gave us that first hunting without permission. And I got to keep the elk and I didn't lose my hunting privileges. Yeah, that's, that's but uh, the other one would have cost me the elk, probably cost me several years of hunting privileges and uh, certainly a significant more fine. But mm -hmm. if it is the hunter's responsibility to know where they are and I failed to do that. It's been almost 20 years ago now before before Onyx was a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these mapping software is really, they make it a lot easier for a hunter to know where they are. And that's one of the reasons why we partner with Onyx now as part of our program to uh, make sure that all of our hunters are equipped uh, with the technology to help prevent silly mistakes like that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Could you address address corner crossing? Because some people yep. will say, it's, "Oh, you're going to get it's, there." It's, it's, okay. it's in here. All right. Uh, I'll uh, I'll keep her. I've got to keep her going, or I'm going to run out of time. Okay. Uh, loan and transfer of a license. What that means is the license with the name on it. That's the only person that can harvest that animal, and it's a very common violation. Um, and I don't mean I don't mean to sound uh, sexist, but a lot of times what it is is uh, the daughter or the wife doesn't hunt, and the husband or the brother goes out and fills the tag, and that's illegal on two two fronts. It's illegal for the person to loan the tag, and it's illegal for the person to use the tag. Shooting from the road or a vehicle, very common violation in Montana. Uh, in Montana, it's not a footage thing from the center line. You can't shoot from across uh, the road or from the shoulder or borrow pit. So if you have a road in the middle and two ditches and a fence on each side, there's nowhere in between those fences you can legally shoot. Uh, and it's also illegal to shoot from a vehicle. Um, unless you're on private land, but the vehicle can't be moving. So, unlawful possession. Unlawful possession is somewhat uh, akin to murder. Um, if you murder somebody, the statute of limitations never goes away. Uh, just like the, the rack that Ed showed us today, it, if he actually took that illegally, he could never possess it legally ever. And if a gay warden came along and was able 20 years later to prove that you took it illegally, you're in unlawful possession of a deer. So um, let's just hope that Sam doesn't have more to the story or anything like that. <laughs> well, he's starting. <laughs> uh oh. He's giving you the evil eye. He's giving me the evil eye. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? I'm just joking. With no, that's you. all right. <laughs> um, me too. <laughs> waste of game is another very. Um, common thing and what that means in Montana on a big game animal you're required to take the four quarters back straps and tenderloins what that means is you don't have to take neck meat and you don't have to take below the hock um, so or you don't have to take rib meat and, and now that's not the same in every state in Alaska they are much more specific on what you have to take you have to take rib meat on a moose in Alaska uh, so Depending on Christina, if you're in Georgia, your your regulations are going to be different than ours for sure. But waste of game means that you're leaving uh, edible meat in the field. Tagging one of the more common violations. Uh, simply, what that means is you have a tag in your pocket. You're supposed to affix it to the animal, validated um, before you move it. Uh, that that's changed in the last few years used to say immediately upon kill means you, uh, you know, had to tag it the minute you walked up to it and made sure it was dead. Now it's when you start moving the animal. And that was one of those changes you'd, ha you'd have to follow. Evidence of sex has also changed. Um, what that means is you have to leave something that, so the game warden can prove that it's a buck or a, a cow or a calf or be able to prove the sex. Um, they changed the regulation and they made it muddier than what it used to be, um, which is terrible. But that's the way things go. The pendulum always moving. Good, not so good. Uh, residency is also very common in Montana. In Montana, we limit how many non-resident licenses are sold. And sometimes there's a higher demand than there is uh, of licenses we have available. And so people cheat. And what I mean is they establish false residencies. They get a PO box, they obtain a Montana driver's license, but they don't live here. And those are kind of white collar investigations. They're fun, uh, made a lot of them. I'm gonna slide through these a little bit. These kind of break what we were just talking about down about each law, unless you have a question on it. Um, this is the evidence of sex. This is the tagging one. This one on our tags, it clearly says you have to notch out the day and the month. 
one of the biggest things I always saw was people would notch it out. They wouldn't take the triangle. They just put a slit in it. And that always ended up being an education talk. And I'd break out my knife and make the other, the other cut. So just one other note on tagging. Oftentimes folks wonder, you know, if, if you're not sure who shot the animal over in, out of Gardner, they used to have what they called a firing line and folks would line up on this draw. And when the elk came out, you know, 40 people are shooting at the elk. Well, some people just run down there and put their tag on it. Um, and it became legally their, their animal because the way the law is written, it's whoever has their tag on the carcass is the possessor of that critter. And another one that I had to, almost had to fight with a guy over my biggest elk because he thought he had shot at it. Well, he had shot at it, he just didn't hit it. And even if he had, it fell down when I shot at it. So I was halfway through gutting it out by the time he got there. He wanted to pick a fight on the, on the mountain. Yeah, I've seen several of those. Been the referee in a couple of doozies. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a couple bulls that were shot off the interstate. Uh, I just finished eating my lunch at the cafe in Lima, actually not Lima, but Dell, Montana. And uh, these were right out in the flat. Uh, some guys from out of state uh, locked it up and bailed out on the interstate and shot these two bulls on private property without permission from the roadway. They are in the back of my truck there. So, so what they do wrong? Yeah. <laughs> what What did they do right? You know. Nothing. Yeah. Um, they left money behind. State. This is a an example of unlawful possession. This isn't a, a garage or a barn that we found. This is kind of a brag uh, photo for uh, me and my sergeant. This was that case out of Sealy Lake that we made. Um, all these animals were shot by one guy over a 10 year period. And we were able to go through uh, photographs um, and other evidence and prove that he shot multiple animals in each year, making them all illegal. And this is that possession thing. Um, actually that, that big white tail buck in the top there was shot in Pennsylvania. We were and uh, poached in Pennsylvania. We were able to prove it. And that big bear in the middle was also poached in Pennsylvania, and we were able to prove that as well. So possession is a big deal. Uh, simulated wildlife, this is something that game wardens use in almost every state now. Um, I think myself and another game warden probably set the record in Montana when these first came out on how many cases we would make. Uh, out of Butte, um, the very first day I ran a spike bull elk in a brow time bull area. We had 13 people shoot the spike bull. And the next day we went to the same spot and had 10. Um, so, uh, and we got the same guy three times in one year shoot, <laughs> shooting decoys. So he totaled his truck the, sec the third time trying to outrun us. Um, and then another time we, the numbers sound made up because it's so perfect, but it's true. We got, we ran a mule deer buck decoy at night and we had 10 vehicles come by and they all shot it. And we had one guy tell me, geez, there used to be a lot of bucks in here. I said, yeah, it used to be, <laughs> you know, and out of that group, one of them was a retired Oregon state trooper. One was a preacher and one was a local taxidermist. So Ethical behavior, and this is kind of what, you know, the decoy thing um, kind of does. It puts a, a, an animal, a hunter, and a game warden in the same spot, and you get a watch to see how that hunter reacts, you know. There's nothing that ever says you have to pull the trigger on an animal, um, you know. And in a lot of cases in Montana, there, you know, you get away with just about anything. Nobody's watching. It's big country. Um, so that decoy kind of tests the, the moral makeup of that hunter. Here's a, a bad situation. Um, 
you wonder how I get these photos. And again, when I put this slide series together, I'd already retired. So I, I just had to use photos I had, but a lot of these photos are from the game warden TV show that was on the outdoor channel. Um, for about six years, Montana was showcased on that. But this is one that we got. And again, this is a, an ethical dilemma. It wasn't anything we could do about it legally, but this guy here, you could tell by his body language that he's getting, getting a butt chewing by two of us. Uh, he let a, a 12 year old kid, and it, as you could tell in that picture, it was cold that morning. It was below zero. He let a 12 year old kid shoot offhand at a herd of elk, you know, probably 200 yards away. And he was just hitting elk and they weren't falling. And uh, other hunters were seeing it from a distance and we hurried up and got there. We could never find a dead elk, but there were blood sprays all over the snow. So he had hit several elk. And uh, so anyway, it was an education moment. We did go back and track and we kind of worked with the kid and showed him the blood. And, and, uh, and I think he was using a 243 as well, which isn't really a good elk gun. This is me talking to a landowner, um, worked a lot with landowners. They put up with a tremendous amount uh, of, of guff from a lot of bad hunters uh, that don't close gates. They drive where they want. They spread nap weed, you know, they shoot up stuff. They take things that have been there for maybe 50 years and, you know, it just, it leaves a bad taste in a lot of these landowners' mouths. So um, just a, a plug for two weeks from now on June 8th, we're going to have a landowner forum to talk about many of these very things. Yep. Things that hunters do right and things that hunters don't do right. We talked about that one here. Yeah, here's driving off road. You know, it's clearly a sign in this picture. You can't maybe read the wording on it, but clearly a sign that says don't drive off road. And, you know, once one person does it, then everybody does it, I swear. Um, these are, this is, this is an old one. Holy cow, we're going back in time on this one. Um, I got five bull elk in the back of my truck, and those are all trespass bulls in, in that Drummond Phillipsburg area. Here's just a slide to represent criminal trespass. Again, we talked about it, and uh, it's clearly marked and uh, they're dragging a, a deer uh, through a fence. They cut the fence to get it through there. Um, this was a bill that was proposed. It didn't, it didn't pass, and it was to make uh, going on somebody's property to collect antlers uh, criminal trespass. And, and I guess, it, you know, it, it didn't pass, but there are every year landowner, a lot of these legislators are landowners. So um, they know that they put up with a tremendous amount and they'll give people permission to hunt or belong to the block management program, but they want trespassers punished. And the trespassing laws are getting tougher and tougher. Um, we talk about stream access a bit. In Montana, we're very lucky. We have a, a thing called the stream access law. And in 1985, uh, an effort from sportsmen from Butte were able to get this thing um, through with some attorneys. Um, it, and it's very good. It allows you to recreate between the ordinary high water marks. And, and, and what that means is you can float it, you can fish it, you can waterfowl hunt it, but it's not for big game. So, it, it, and there's some gray area in this stream access law in that some people will say, well, can I float down the stream and take my gun? And when I get to a piece of private land that I have permission or a piece of public land, can I hunt it then? And, you know, it, it doesn't say you can't. Um, but what happens when the big buck steps out on a piece of ground that you don't know who owns it? Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty clear it's not for big game hunting, but people use it. Here's waste of game. Uh, this is me helping my buddy pack out his elk. 
looks to me like I'm dragging two and carrying one. I don't know what he was doing. Um, but uh, I, I think I'm saying a little prayer there <laughs> before I take off. Please let me get to the truck. Um, we see a lot of ways to game. These photographs indicate some ways to game cases that I, I'd made over the years. The one there on the left are four hind quarter or four quarters of a deer that were pretty much dried, drier than jerky. And in and in those boxes on the right, if you look in there, there were boxes of waterfowl that had been shot, geese and ducks, and just thrown away in the dump. I think that's one of the more common waste to game animals that I see is waterfowl. People like to shoot them, but they don't like to clean them and eat them. So they get shot and thrown away. Especially college kids, they do it a lot. <laughs> uh, this is the residency law, as you can see just by the number of words there. It's a complicated thing. Um, and there's a provision in there for uh, veterans or uh, people that are in the armed services. Um, if you're TDY or whatever, uh, you don't have to be here 180 days uh, to establish residency. Um, it's a much shorter time. Um, so let's see, maps and GPS. This is talking about things such as Onyx maps and whatever. There's no, really, there's no reason um, to trespass anymore. Uh, with Google Earth and everything. Um, it, there's no reason for it. Here's, here's what Ed was talking about, corner crossing. What corner crossing is, is land is divided into sections. And uh, so in the sections on a, on a, on a map are colored, uh, green is forest service, blue is state land, yellow is BLM, white is private. And, and, and so if you look at that slide and you say section one is forest service, and section 11 is forest service, but section two and section 12 are private land. It's not legal to cross at that corner from section one to 11 because you physically commit a trespass on section two and section 12 when you do it. That's the opinion of the AG's office. It's been that way for a long time, but it gets challenged uh, and each County attorney is responsible for prosecuting it. And FWP doesn't make a move to address this because it's too contentious. Um, it's contentious with their constituents, the hunters, and it's contentious with the landowner that has those pieces. So it's a, it's a no win deal. Uh, it's too bad it's not settled um, because it doesn't get prosecuted very often. From a technicality, mm -hmm. that intersection of those properties is an infinitesimally small mm -hmm. point. And, and you can't physically, as Jeff says, you can't physically get from one point to the other without your, some of you is over section yeah. two or section 12. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, in, our, in our program, we won't do that. Or if, if we have opportunity to hunt on sections like that, we will secure permission from the adjacent property owner to to make that crossing, but uh, so far that hasn't been a, a, an issue within our our program. But um, we would we would go to that extent to make sure we may not have permission to hunt on section two, but we're going to get permission to uh, trespass to cross their property to get onto the mm -hmm. next section. That's the right way to do it. And, and, and FWP is constantly working on access issues. And one of the ones they have established, it's relatively new, is PLPA. That's private land, public access. And, and what it is, it's a program that if you have one of these corner crossings, it, and, and it can really open up a lot of land. If that one corner crossing was allowed, there's a lot of land that will be landlocked um, that isn't accessible. And in a lot of those situations with this PLPA, FWP is working on that and they have money that they're able to go in and negotiate with the landowner and say, hey, would you allow corner crossing? And what would it take to allow you to do that? And they can pay them, I think it's up to $15,000 to allow it, or they could build a road or a gate or whatever, you know, the landowner wants done there. 
and, and it's starting to be a pretty successful deal because um, generally a lot of cases, that's all the landowner wants is, well, if you put a gate or a road there, okay. Um, so uh, warden's working with landowners and sportsmen. Uh, I put this slide in there. Uh, this is something that game wardens have always done. I mean, I've always, not all of them maybe, but in my region, this was a must. And um, this is helping landowners. Uh, this is this particular landowner allows elk hunting on his place. The elk would come down every night, get caught in there and shot up in the morning and then tear back through his fence and tear it apart. He'd have two, three miles of fence that was just destroyed by the end of the rifle season. So there's three game wardens there. I'm in the middle and these are two of my guys when I was the captain and we got a couple sportsmen's groups together and we got together and and we fix that fence. Uh, and that means a lot. That means a lot to the landowner to see that happen. So those are all good things to do. And I say get involved as a hunter. That's a, that's a smart thing to do, whether it's helping brand or hay or, or uh, pick up rocks, whatever it is. If you can help them, um, it may gain you access uh, onto their property. I know a lot of these traditional landowners can't find help anymore no different than Walmart or Wendy's or wherever, it's hard to find workers. And uh, so they appreciate the help. Um, wardens in the field, uh, you know, I don't know exactly how many there are today, right to the number, but Montana has between 75 and 85 field wardens. And that doesn't count sergeants and captains and investigators, but, on the average, there's in the smaller counties, there's one warden per county. Um, but in bigger counties like Missoula, there's three. I think there's two in Beaverhead County. Um, Beaverhead County, for example, is larger than the state of Rhode Island. And I don't know how many wardens Rhode Island has, but I know Beaverhead County's got two wardens. So that's a lot of country to cover. You get the Garfield County, that's larger than half the East yeah. Coast states. At one time, I was the only game warden uh, in Northeast Montana. Uh, I was stationed out of Glasgow and I had everything to the Canadian border to North Dakota. And uh, it was a lot of area. Lot of area. <laughs> so um, the average game warden district is about 2,000 square miles. Um, so poaching, hunting illegally, what, it, what does that mean? Um, for the last 20 years, Montana really targeted large scale poaching operations. Um, we've noticed the increase in that uh, each year. Uh, and, and what poaching does, it puts a lot of pressure on the trophy class animals, which is important because those are your cream of the crop, good genetic animals that you want to breed. And there's a lot of pressure put on those animals um, by poachers. Commercialization, illegal outfitting increasing. What I mean by illegal outfitting is I'm not saying outfitters are illegal. What I mean by that is there are people that will outfit or take people hunting illegally in the fact that they don't have a license. And generally with a license and an outfitter, you have a designated day use area that you can use and you're kind of constrained to where you can actually hunt unless you're hunting on private. And a lot of these illegal outfitters, they don't have any boundaries, they just go wherever they want, do whatever they want, and don't pay any insurance. Um, our covert unit, animal, or uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has a, an undercover unit, and they really target these type of operations. They try to get in and book hunts with them. Um, individuals see ways to profit off our wildlife. Uh, Thrill, thrill killing seems to be on the rise. And what we mean by that is that's a, a Montana drive-by. And we see that on the rise. And it's generally young, young males that are um, got nothing to do. And they drive around and they see animals and they shoot them. And they drive away. They're not hunting. They're just shooting. Um, every year you see it in the paper. I think a couple of years ago, there were three six point bulls shot over in the muscle shell. Just kids driving around shooting. 
misdemeanor versus felony. I got to really pick it up here. I'm sorry. I'm going to go long probably. Misdemeanor means it's generally a, a lesser degree citation, and it means it's something you can go in and plead guilty to or not guilty and pay a fine. Uh, a felony is something that's going to go on your record, and generally you could end up serving prison time or paying a very large fine. Uh, sometimes I hear a lot of hunters say, well, you need tougher laws. Montana has very tough laws. What Montana needs is consistent court decisions. Um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, most misdemeanors carry a maximum of $1,000 fine and six months in jail. If you committed a, a, a misdemeanor crime and it was a bad one, that's a pretty good fine, $1,000 in six months in jail. Um, and then restitution can be added. In Montana, there's a value established in a bond schedule for each animal, um, you know, not each individual animal, but each species of animal and what, they're, what Montana values them at. Felony wildlife are for larger cases. Um, and generally, the restitution value has to exceed $1,000. So for example, a cow elk has a restitution value of $1,000. So if you shoot a cow, cow elk illegally, you're not committing a felony. But if you shoot two cow elk illegally, you are committing a felony. It has to do with the aggregate value of the number of the dollars of a restitution. Animal. What's the value of like the big horn sheep? 30,000. So that, that automatically jumps into a felony. felony yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and it, it's still, you're not bound to go to a felony on that. Um, I, I've made three sheep cases in my career. You think, oh, you only made three. Well, they're hard to make. Um, and I only had one of them that was $33,000 fine. I had one that was 13,000 and another one that was a few thousand, um, but it wasn't a lot, they were used. So, and you go restitution value, who, who establishes that? That was established in legislature. And if you look at the regulations, Montana regulations, for example, a bull elk is 8,000. Uh, I think a moose is 6,000. Um, and, and a lot of it is scored by either Boone and Crockett score or to be a uh, uh, $8,000 elk, you have to have, it has to be a six pointer better. So it's either a, an antler measurement or a, Boone Crockett score that makes it. And so any game violation could result in this. So yep. um, that trespassing, that criminal trespass where you harvested an elk yeah. could, could result in a, in a felony. It, it could, but generally game wardens look at it a little closer. If it's an open season and you have a valid license, that takes it out of that realm. The, the, the violation there was just the trespass. So you didn't shoot it during closed season and you had a tag. Now, if you shoot it on private property without permission during closed season and without a license, you're going to get charged with a felony. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, the other way, no. Um, and this, this is just the felony statute F. Um, and, and what I mean by Montana has tough laws you know, the, the misdemeanor um, is, is uh, generally a thousand dollar maximum fine, but a felony has a uh, uh, $50,000 ceiling on it. And also a uh, maximum of five years in, in state prison. And <clears throat> believe it or not, FWP has sent several people to prison for poaching, um, either state or federal, but uh, those, are, those are generally the large, large, scale cases where somebody goes to prison. But it's there and it can be used. Um, this is talking a little bit more about trophy restitution. How trophy restitution started was it was from a, a special interest group, Montana Bow Hunters Association. Uh, they came to me and we were talking about it. And they said, you know, you guys just don't get you know, enough fines, you guys need to get more teeth into it. And they came up with this restitution idea and it made it through the legislature. 
And as you can see, the numbers there, 30,000 for a big orange sheep, 8,000 for a six point or better bull, 8,000 for a big buck deer. Uh, I think moose is too low and mountain goat's too low, but, and I think grizzly bear is too low, but those numbers have been the same numbers for 15 years. They haven't been adjusted for anything. So, um, so di discretion on grizzly bear, Mm -hmm. Somebody in season with a tag shoots a black, thinks they're shooting a black bear, ends up being a grizzly bear. Mm -hmm. Does that automatically jump them to a felony? Well, generally what we do on those is we put a grizzly bear amount in there thinking that someday we would have a grizzly season, but they're still a listed species. And right now the feds handle those cases generally, unless there's not a fed available He'll tell us to go ahead and issue a state violation. But um, generally, because it's still a listed species, the federal agent will handle the grizzly bear cases. We may do all the work, but the charging will come from the federal agent, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So keep hitting the wrong button. This is a, another big thing, uh, and it's not just to Montana. It's called the Interstate Wildlife Violator Compact. Every state but two has it. And that could have changed, but Massachusetts and Hawaii didn't have it. And what it means is if you lose your privileges to hunt, fish, and trap in one state, you lose them in all the rest of the states. And, and that, that's a big deal. We used to see a lot of people come here, you know, like from Michigan or Minnesota, and we'd catch them and, you know, you'd be writing them tickets and tell them they would probably lose their privileges on this. And they'd say, oh, that's okay. I'm not coming back again anyway. I'm just going to hunt at home. You know, so this has a bigger sting to it. Um, and the list comes out a couple of times a year of everybody in the, in the nation that's revoked. Um, and then you can just, you know, it gets entered into the database. And if somebody tries to buy a license, they can't. Yeah. So is the problem in Montana on a percentage basis the same as, say, in New York, Florida, Iowa? Or does it vary by outdoorsmanship, say? As far as the number of poaching? Uh, on a per capita basis, because we only have a million people. Yeah, so yeah. someplace like Iowa has more, Wisconsin or Minnesota has I five think, times as many people. I don't know what those numbers are, but I would say we're probably higher because we have uh, more desirable species to poach and take. You know? Can you repeat um, the question, please? Yeah. The question. The oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Asking. So I was tell, one. Tell everyone your name. Oh, this is Ed Brown. They, they, he's interested. Anyway, but yeah, big Ed. So um, my question is that Montana seems to have poaching. Is it any different, say, on a per capita basis than, say, Florida, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, um, where people do hunt? Um, or is, is it the population, or does it happen more in Montana? Uh, I don't know what those numbers are. I would say just probably by sheer numbers in those bigger states, they're gonna, if you look at total number of violations and that encompasses a lot of things when you say total number of violations. Uh, and for example, in Florida, you may have shot too small of an alligator or something. We don't have that regulation. So it's really hard, it's really hard to compare, you know, uh, apples and oranges on that. Um, I do know Montana is very desirable by people all around the country to come here and, and, and hunt. And we also know it's very desirable for people to come here and poach. Um, so uh, I had read it was the number one poacher destination out of state. Is that fairly close? It, you know, five, Alaska well, Peterson uh, Hunting Magazine put out an article a few years ago and they listed like the top 10 uh, yeah, poaching by. You know, poaching cases in the nation. And Montana had two of them, but in one of the articles, in the Ruth case was one of them, in one of the articles that they wrote about Montana, it said, on any given year, there's a case made in Montana that would fit in this top 10. So it's a high, per, yeah, high, it's, high target. It's sad. It's like uh, running a red light. If, if you catch one, there's probably a whole bunch you didn't catch. Well, you know, I'll I'll just tell a quick a quick story. We were running undercover an undercover case on an illegal outfitter from Alabama, 
And unbeknownst to him, he hired an illegal guide who happened to be an undercover game warden. And so the undercover game warden's wearing a wire, and I'm actually the guy sitting across the lodge down by the river in a van. True, in a van. Down, down by, by the river. river. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, and I had the earphones on, and I was, I was listening to the conversation that was going on, and, and the undercover warden was sitting beside this uh, pretty hefty guy from Alabama. He, he wrote uh, in the newspaper called the Birmingham News, and he wrote an outdoor section. And, and I, I'm not a little guy, but this guy made me look small. Um, he's probably 320, 30 pounds. And uh, anyway, he was sitting next to our undercover warden at the supper table. And he said, leaned over and he looked at him. He said, Bob, you know what I like about Montana? And, and Bob says, no, what do you like? He says, just no law out here. He said that, <laughs> he, he said that to an, yeah. an undercover game warden. And so, of course, as the leader of the, of the takedown, I said, I want to arrest him at the airport. And, uh, and I did. And when I put, took him out, put him in my truck, I said, you know, Mike, I said, I just want to get one thing straight. There is law in Montana. And he goes, yes, sir. I, I, I believe so. <laughs> and, you know, and hats off to him. He went back and uh, he paid his fines and took his wallop and went back and wrote an article and put it in the, in the, in the newspaper. And he didn't have to do that, I don't think. But anyway, it, it took courage to write that article and tell about his deal. So this is the thing I was talking about. <laughs> Eight biggest, eight, yeah. eight biggest poaching cases in history. And uh, sadly, Montana can just about top any state in the nation. So it, it's, this, is, this, and this is just an example of it. Uh, we made an undercover case in the Bitterroot Valley. Uh, I knew a guy, I had a, great, I had a lot of great informants. And I knew a guy was coming here from Pennsylvania <clears throat> with a gun called an arrow gun. And it's a, a Ruger 1022 with a, a kit that you can get off a, of a website called swivelmachine.com. And it's like 200 bucks and you can make a Ruger 1022 shoot arrows at 300 feet per second. And uh, this guy was coming here from Pennsylvania to go to hunting district 270, to drive around and shoot as many big mule deer bucks as he could. Long this story. is our trophy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so... Long story short, we caught him through a lot of hard work, um, and two game wardens flew to Pennsylvania and took him down in Pennsylvania. Um, but when the undercover guys were done with that case, they called me and said, hey, we got a couple more days. Do you have anything else we can work down here? And I said, yeah, you know what? I do. I said, I know it's going to sound cliche, but you got to go to this one bar. <laughs> and if you go there, just start talking about baseball. And if the guy's there, he's going to, he's going to surface. Well, so this is in Pennsylvania. No, this is in Hamilton, Montana. So they go there and they're the only ones in there, but the bartender and they're talking, talking and then, and talking about softball and baseball. And literally within a half hour, the target shows up and they start buddying up with him. And within a half hour of buddying up with him, the big buck, Right here, we call that the Goligoski buck. It's a beautiful buck. He took, the middle one that's mounted there. Yeah, though. yeah. He took him. That guy it's took our guy. undercovers to where that buck hung in a house. And we call it the Goligoski buck because that was the last name of the guy that shot that buck. He'd never had a permit for that district. And they pointed out the window and said, they got it right there on that ridge. And that was the start of that case that day. By the time that day was over, he had taken our undercover game wardens to five different locations and they got to see all these bucks. It was ego. This guy had an ego that just couldn't be, you know, quenched. So all these bucks that you see, everyone there that a warden's holding was an $8,000 restitution buck. So just per buck. Per buck. So there's $40,000 worth of deer that were taken out of hunting district 270 by these guys that were hunting behind a locked gate. And it just, it was just, uh, 
Do you have any spare time? Do you have anything else for us to do? Yeah, go do this. You know, and so some game wardens can do that and some can't, you know. Um, this is a bowl that I took on an opening day thing. Uh, it started out as a simple trespass. And uh, I'm going to tell the really short version of this. It started out as a simple trespass. It ended up being a ballistics case. And uh, I was able to recover two bullets out of this elk. I also found out from the hired man that he thought that this guy that was there the day before target shooting might have been the suspect. So I went up to where he had been shooting and ran a metal detector on the bank behind his target that he left on the fence post and found two more bullets. And they were uh, Grand Slam bullets. You know, the spear makes a bullet, that had a GS on the bottom, that's the Grand Slam. I happened to know a couple of really good guys at the crime lab. I took the bullets in, matched them to the bullets that come from the elk. And they said, well, whoever shot these bullets into that hill is the same one that shot that elk. Long story short, a hired man, I come to find out, knew the guy that did this. They were friends. The hired man was in a tight spot because he could get thrown off the ranch. They said, well, you have his phone number? He says, yeah. Can you call him? He says, yeah. Why don't you give him a phone call? Tell him the wardens are coming out here looking for the gun that he left behind. Because what he had done was he, he shot that elk and he got afraid because a bunch of people started showing up and he hid the gun. And oh. he drove out, he left the gun in the woods. And uh, he buried it or just well, he cached it in the bush? Or? He called the guy and said, hey, game wardens out here looking for your gun. Where is it? He wouldn't tell him over the phone. He, he, he was pretty smart. He said, you never know where those guys are at, like three feet away from you. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, anyway, long story short, we went back and spent, me and the hired man spent about three hours out there. And uh, we're on one side of a gulch and we looked over on the other side of the gulch and, and uh, I give credit to the hired man. He says, hey, look over there. Yeah, I see it. It was that duff. And the duff, you know, was all light needles, you know, but there was one spot where it was all turned over. But we raced each other over there, you know, and, and we get over there and pull it apart and there's a 243 in a case hidden under those pine needles. Wow. And then I took that back to the crime lab and the bullets matched the bullets from the elk and the target shooting. So I called the guy back in that I knew the gun belonged to and I talked to him before about it. Of course, he denied it. You know, and I brought him back into the office, and showed him the gun. I said, is that yours? <laughs> he said, my wife's going to kill me. <laughs> it cost him 10000 um, So what, um, what's a, so, so one thing I just want to say for the audience is USOH Warrior Team Hunt Program, we do believe in the North American model of conservation stand against commercialization of wildlife. But at the same time, we understand that there is restitution and numbers put on bulls. I, you know, one of our landowners said a trophy bull on his land is worth 25 grand. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? These days? And he said, yeah, it, he it, said, it is. It, you know, it's, he said that's how he looks at it. If someone poaches, he yep. goes 25, 30 grand, lost to the ranch, to the state, and the people. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a it's a loss to him, and that's that that's somewhat a commercialization of wildlife, and that's that's meant for breeding. Yeah, that's a big that's a big. What's the value uh, again? We couldn't hear you, Sam. What's the value? Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I, I, what he said was uh, this landowner: if somebody if somebody poaches a big bull elk off of his land, essentially that's twenty five thousand dollars out of his pocket. And, and, and that's one way of thinking about it. Um, but it's a loss to the state. But it's a loss to the state. It's a loss of revenue to him if he's making money off wildlife Absolutely. on his yeah. property. And, and that's, in a sense, that's kind of commercialization of wildlife as well, in that he's making money selling hunts, which is legal, you know, but it is kind of commercialization of wildlife. And that's a, that's a big dilemma that we face out here in Montana is we have a lot of wealthy landowners or traditional landowners that own a lot of land that, har that harbor a lot of elk that 
don't get hunted by the general public. You know, they get hunted by people that are able to pay $25,000 to kill an elk or uh, family only or close friends, you know. So there are a lot of elk in Montana that are not huntable by the general public. And is it, what's the restitution on that elk right now? It's, it's uh, eight thousand. Eight thousand. Yeah. But but we we would say that twenty five to thirty grand uh, would be something that a lot of people are willing to pay. For oh that. yeah, that represents an opportunity yeah. loss. Yes. Oh yeah. To that rancher. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so why doesn't the state? Uh, the, I'm just oscillating out loud sure. here, but for the viewers mainly. Why don't they up at 25 or 30? Why, why is it still at eight, do you think? Is that just a, uh, trying to avoid the commercial well, stuff? Or? Part of it is just trying to stay within uh, reason. And, okay. and what and why I mean that is- Like know, a local guy makes a mistake. And yeah, he's, he's you know, hammered. the guy that's pumping gas or right. turning a ranch heat, you know, this is already pretty high. Um, you know, and the thing is, is we've got 56 counties and that means we've got a hundred plus JPs in the state yeah. and they're not all consistent. Right. The law may say this, but the judge has the final say. That's right. So you're over in Weibo and the judge is like, I, I, well, five grand is what I wish I could do. Yeah. Before I do eight, you know? But if you're from Minnesota and the judge from Weibo see, you know, <laughs> I mean, so it, 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 it uh, yeah. you Georgia. Know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He's accused when he come out. Yeah, uh, we want that Georgia bird hunt, though. <laughs> I'm going to slip on through a couple. Thanks, of these. Jeff. This, me ask oh yeah, you bet. This was a uh, that that case that I showed you oh, where wow. we had all yeah. the animals on the wall, and I said it was the biggest one. I said we'll never make another case like that again. Literally within five years, less than ten air miles from that location. All those animals you see on that wall were taken by one guy illegally. And so, you know, you, you kind of think, you know, how many people are doing this, you know, and how many are we catching? We know we're missing way more than what we catch. We don't like to admit that, but we know we are. And what kind of resource would we have out there if we all did it right and we all did illegal? But I mean, this guy drew a moose permit, a legal moose permit, and he shot four moose in one year because they weren't big enough or he wanted to get a bigger one. He'd walk up to him and see him and walk away from him. That mountain goat in that picture, we have him on video. Um, he killed, he had a goat permit for that year, but he killed it in the area that was closed. And we had to do this because he had rubber gloves on when he did it and he took the rubber gloves off and he put them underneath a rock by the trail and he laughed, and this is on videotape, and he said, those will be there 100 years from now, you know, and I argue with that, but he said they'd still be there in 100 years. Well, we knew that kind of told us for sure where he was at, where he killed that goat. We went back into that area, and we found the gloves, you know, so they weren't there 100 years from now. So. <laughs> I like where the judge called Peyton a killer, not a hunter, because we have a saying in our warrior hunt program, Whenever a hunter, you know, says, "Man, that was a tough hike," or "That was a tough one," we say, "That's why we call hunting, not killing." That's right. That's you know, right. we want you to hunt. Yeah. We want to respect the animal. That's right. There's a difference between the two. Yep. Otherwise, if you just kill her, exactly, you're not in our program. Federal Wildlife, just just let you know that there is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I think Montana has three agents. Um, How and, do they split that? You know, there was one in Billings, okay. there was one in Great Falls, and there was one in Missoula. And the one in Missoula was here because of grizzly bears. The one in Great Falls was there because of waterfowl mainly. And the one in Billings, just because it was the biggest city in Montana. So um, it, it's, it's nice to have these guys. Uh, I've flown to like six different states with a federal agent either with me or meet me at the airport. And they're really good to have when you go rap on somebody's door and you, you say, Montana game warden, and they look at you and go, well, we're not in Montana. And then the guy flips his federal badge out and says, nope, and that's why I'm here. And you can talk to him or you can talk to me. What's it gonna be? 
And most people, after they've had a little conversation, will much rather talk with the state warden than the federal warden, because the federal warden is there because an, a an animal was taken illegal in Montana and taken to another state, and that's a violation of the Lacey Act. And that's why it's so valuable to have good relationships with federal law enforcement. In 1900, John Lacey, a uh, legislator representative from Iowa, helped pass this. And this had more to do with market hunting uh, per se than it did, did with it, each individual animal, but it's still the same. If you take an animal illegally in one state and transport to another state, it's a Lacey violation. And so between the Lacey violation and unlawful possession, a guy could come here and poach something and take it back home. And, you know, if he gets caught, it's a pretty big deal. This is a federal issue. Yep. This is a trophy sale. These are the sale of antlers that were confiscated um, in Missoula. This was the year I retired. It was one of the last major things I did before I retired. It was our turn to have the trophy sale. Um, we sold over $60,000 worth of antlers. I know. contributed that year. I remember yeah. seeing you there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, couldn't afford it somehow. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we do with yeah. it. You know, a lot of people ask, well, what do you do with all those horns or antlers? And if they don't end up on a wall in an office or an educational thing, they end up at the sale. That was a good day, right? That was a good it was day. a good day. Yeah. yeah. I remember right Yeah. Now. And this is just more federal stuff. We'll talk about the Migratory Bird Act. Um, and basically this protects 170 species of birds, not just ducks and geese, but that fly, you know, to Canada, to the Mexico, um, big deal. I like hunting ducks and geese. Nice. Um, Where are the pups? Yeah, they're my buddies from Butte. That's my buddy, Dale Josevich. He's actually that short. <laughs> You're not standing on a hill. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, no. <laughs> the Endangered Species Act. Uh, Montana has, you know, uh, we we have a lot of experience with this, dealing with grizzly bears. Um, we had it with wolves. Wolves are delisted. Um, I'll put my plug in for grizzly bears. They need to be delisted, as far as I'm concerned. Um, they can be regulated. Delisted doesn't mean open season. Delisted means the hunting North American model can actually be used as a tool to manage the animal. Right now, grizzly bears die every year at the hands of fish, wildlife, and parks as control or uh, wildlife services. And my opinion is they might as well be harvested by a hunter. Yeah. So that so that grizzly bear that was hanging around Shoto. Mm -hmm. Um, if it went into a house, does the castle doctrine apply? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes it does. You have the right to protect so yourself. You know, and that, 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 on a light note, that leads to a more serious note. This is a, a female grizzly that we snared up on the Two Kirk Ranch. Uh, and uh, we were actually trying to snare. Yeah. Yeah. So we snared her. We were actually trying to snare a, a, a boar um, that had killed a calf, and we caught her. And then we had to free dart her cub, and we took him back to the uh, a piece of state game range, the Blackfoot Clearwater Game Range, and we worked her, tagged her. Um, we brought down an elk that we had in our freezer and left it on the site. So when she woke up, it had hold her there for a while, and it did. We monitored her. We put a radio collar on her, kept her there. The very next year, she had an encounter with an elk hunter, and she had two more cubs, and uh, she killed the hunter. And uh, so it was a bad deal. Um, she'd been a good bear for many, many years. Yep. So bear spray or sidearm when you're hunting up the Blackfoot and then that? Sealy Swan Range and maybe even around uh, southwestern Montana. I carry I carry both. Okay. You know, to be honest, uh, I carry a pistol on my chest, and I and I because I hunt that grizzly country a lot. Mm -hmm. I carry a pistol on my chest, and I carry pepper spray on my back too. And 
And my wife always asks, because we hunt together, she always asks me, well, what would you do? You know, would you grab your pistol or would you grab your bear spray? And, yep. You know, it kind of it kind of depends on the situation, you know. Uh, the gun is, I don't have time to get to my spray because I can pull my gun and shoot it faster than I can get that spray and pull the thing and, and do it. So um, hopefully I'd be able to use spray and not have to use a gun, but I actually feel more comfortable with my gun, but they say spray works. I've never had to spray a bear, so, so I don't know. But I'd carry both personally. Um, this is just to, to talk about bears uh, and endangered species and kind of what's going on. Uh, this group, I support Grizzly Bear Hunt, Western Bear Foundations out of Cody, Wyoming. A friend of mine kind of runs that group. Um, they, they really advocate strongly for grizzly bear hunting. Uh, this was a, uh, an IGBC meeting uh, that I went to in Polson. I think I was the only hunter there. There were a lot of non-anti-hunters there. This was one of their signs that they had that they sat down when they went to go have lunch. Um, this is a battle that's fought every day on a lot of different fronts that sportsmen sometimes don't realize. Um, there are a lot of anti-hunters out there. State versus Stasso. This is just to talk a little bit briefly about uh, native uh, hunting rights in Montana. Some states don't have this. Montana does. We have seven Indian reservations. Uh, we have seven treaties. Um, so each treaty is a little bit different. Um, Stasso was uh, a member of the Salish Kootenai tribe. And uh, what this basically says in the state versus Stasso case is, Stasso was a, like I said, a member of the Salish Kootenai tribe. He came off the reservation. He went on to forest service and he killed a deer. And basically, long story short, it went to court. And because uh, he'd been cited for taking a deer illegally. And he said that he took that deer on forest service land. That's open and unclaimed land. And he was able to prove courts agreed with him. And so what that means is in the, under the Hellgate Treaty that a Native American can come off the reservation and actually harvest animals in what is their Aboriginal hunting territory and, and be okay, as long as they're not on deeded land. If they're on deeded land, they're just like everybody else. Um, so for example, in our neck of the woods here around Missoula, Montana, you may drive up Rock Creek and, and see Native Americans with a, a moose down. And uh, I was the warden in Phillipsburg for a few years and I knew that they were harvesting anywhere from three to 10 moose out of Rock Creek a year. And uh, we only put a couple permits out, you know, for non-tribal uh, members. So they can have a real impact on wildlife. Um, especially when they start finding the honey hole or the target in area, um, they can really put a, a hurt onto species like moose. Right? Can they hunt all year round on average? No, place? no, they 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 have some seasons, and they're they're very liberal, you know, and and, and what they can hunt. Um, some of the reservations in in the state of Montana have very little as far as wildlife law goes. And those are the ones you don't see any wildlife on, you know. But the Salish Kootenai are a really progressive tribe and they have, you know, wildlife on their what I meant was like can they hunt year round like year round, say like on Rock Creek. Because I know one yeah. year I think the the tribe actually criticized some of their tribal members for taking too many moose out yeah. of Rock Creek. I do hunt, I used to hunt a Rock Creek. Rock Creek. That's yeah. why I'm asking. Yeah, they, they do have some seasons and some limits, you know, their limit may be each family can have a moose a year, you know, um, so that's pretty liberal, you know, our families may not ever draw a moose tag, you know, and, and their families can have like moose a year. Um, I think they're starting to get a little bit, you know, more restraint on it, but it's, it's not what we do. Uh, I'm about done. I'm sorry, I've been talking a lot. Uh, enforcement technology. These are just some tools that game wardens use. Uh, you know, as a hunter, every year there's something new that comes out, uh, whether it's scent or, 
or a GPS unit or a, you know, a new gun or a new scope that lights up the reticle and you can see forever, or whatever. Technology is a big thing. Um, the enforcement technology that's used is always just a little bit behind the technology that comes out for hunters. But for example, uh, as a game warden, when I started, number one, we didn't have computers. You know, and, and today they're just commonplace. And a lot of young game wardens can make poaching cases from a computer. And that's like looking at social media, Facebook. I mean, towards the end of my career, I don't know how many times I had to get up and run in and look at what a young warden had found on Facebook. And, and go, what are you looking at? He'd tell me, you know, and, and I was like, holy crap, you know, I, that's amazing, you know, so uh, amazing that people would post stuff that they post. Oh, know. yeah. And then cell <laughs> phones, cell phones are another one, you know, when cell phones first came out uh, as game wardens, we thought, oh, my God, we'll never make a transfer case again, because dad will kill an elk on the mountain and he'll call the wife at work and tell her, hey, you killed a six point bull, you shot it two times, I'm bringing it out. And so that's, that's where we were thinking, but really cell phone forensics has helped us a lot in that um, you know where a phone's at because if it's on, it's pinging and, and you can subpoena those phone records. So when somebody says, I killed something here, but you know, they didn't kill it there. You just subpoena their phone records and see what towers they're hitting off. And you go, well, this day you weren't there. You were here. And you can subpoena phone records, uh, text. I mean, that's the first thing when you grab anybody that poaches anymore is you're looking for the cell phone to grab from them because there are texts on that phone that you want to see. And it takes search warrants to get into it, but it doesn't to take it at that particular time. So um, cell phone forensics is big. Facebook and social media forensics is big. Firearm forensics, ballistics is old school now. You know, um, drone monitoring, we didn't do that when I was there, but it is something that they're using now. Uh, computer forensics, uh, we'd serve search warrants. We'd take their computers because we'd send them to uh, the state criminal lab and they would dissect their computers and pull off tons of things for us to make our poaching cases. Uh, undercover work is something that I really like and uh, did quite a bit of it as a warden. Um, it's very effective. And, and to throw one of those examples out, if you're an undercover operative and you use Facebook and you can be whoever you wanna be on Facebook and the person that you're trying to friend, you just say, well, what kind of person does this guy like to friend? Oh, he likes pretty young girls. That's who I'll be today. I'm a pretty young girl. Boom. <laughs> your friend your friends with him <laughs> so technology works both ways and uh the game wardens just kind of have to stay up on it and, and they make cases I, i'm amazed at what they do um this was a tv show i was involved with uh it was right towards the end of my career um wasn't something that i thought i'd ever do but i was confronted about it and i'm I talked to the chief about it and we were good friends and photoshopped in the name of your hair look down there. Yeah, no, that that was <laughs> that was a while ago. <laughs> but uh it was a very popular TV show on the outdoor channel. It was the most watched show six years in a row. And uh got to meet some pretty cool people. Um so it was fun. Uh, Game wardens do a lot. It's not all law enforcement. This is Reagan out of Butte. He's helping with a sheep transplant. Tipmont, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. Uh, Tipmont is our uh, turn in poacher hotline. Um, I can only advocate with groups like this that this is very, very important. Uh, game wardens need tips. And sometimes you know that somebody's doing something, you don't want to get involved. You don't have to get involved. You can call anonymously, you know, and just say, I know this guy did this. And, you know, the thing is, is um, 
might just be enough to get a game warden started on the on the right track or the right trail. Uh, every year they would keep a map and put a little red pin where the uh, pin stuck in the board of where the tipmont calls came from. And it was ironic that region two uh, was just solid red with pins. Uh, the Bitterroot in the Missoula area, constant calls for tipmont. And, and part of it is the Bitterroot has a lot of, lot of resources in it. A lot of deer, sheep, moose, elk, and a, a lot of small pieces of ground. So a lot of trespass, a lot of corruption. Um, so I'm retired now. I still teach and help out once in a while when I can with the guys, but uh, I missed 20, actually 28 opening days to hunt. Uh, and I'm missing any more. Unless the good Lord says I can't go. But I do like to hunt. That's what got me interested in being a game warden. Part of it had to do with, I always wanted to be a game warden, but I hunted in a lot of different states with my dad. Uh, we weren't rich by any means, but we hunted in Missouri and Wyoming and Colorado. We'd save up our money all year long to be able to go to those places. And uh, all those places we went to as a kid, we ran into poaching, pretty big time poaching going on. and. Uh, you know, when you worked hard all year and you didn't play by the rules and wanted to do it right and got there, maybe didn't harvest an animal or even see an animal, then you run into these people that were poaching. Um, it really dismayed you uh, and made you think bad. But I like to fish. Yeah. So does Brad. That's a nice fish. Yeah. Yeah, I caught that one, Brad. I, I foul hooked her and... Uh, she gave me a good fight because the foul hooked her back towards the tail. And uh, she pulled me in like four or five times and you strip her all out. And I had a fisheries biologist from Idaho watching me catch her. And I finally got her in and took a quick picture and put her back down, and turned her loose. And, and uh, he goes, well, that, that was a hatchery fish. She could have kept that one. I said, well, I'm not going to keep that one. I said, I foul hooked her. And he goes, oh, nobody would have known. <laughs> I said I would have known, <laughs> but uh, anyway, you caught a few big ones this year, didn't you, Brad? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a. I found out this year by my fishing buddy I was fishing with. I never pay attention to records, but on the Clearwater, the steelhead record was broke this year for thirty-nine and a quarter inch fish. I caught a keeper this year. My buddy took a picture of it. I didn't want to deal with it, so I let it go. But I took a quick measurement on it, and I got 39 and a half inches on it. <laughs> uh, is that your personal record, or is that like a state record? That was a state record. God, I thought that one was like 40. <laughs> I would have thought, too, because I've eaten it a few times, not knowing what the record was. Yeah. I thought we put a tape on that fish because I... I was thinking about getting a repo made of it, and uh, I think it was right, right close to forty. Of course, you know it's kind of hard when you, you know, where do you hold it? And you know, it could have been hold it way out. Could have been thirty nine, but it was really <laughs> close to forty inches. I know that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, they're fun to catch. But anyway, I think that's all I have for you, and unless you have some questions, and I'm sure open to answering questions. I know it's getting late, but. Um, if you have any questions of a retired game warden, you're sure more, more than welcome to ask. I'm sharing here. There we are. Okay. Do you have any friends in Georgia that have done what you do? Did? Uh, Obviously, because that's where I'm going to have to try to repeat this. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't, I, I know I've met some Georgia game wardens over the years, uh, I've probably arrested more people from Georgia than I have uh, worked with game wardens, though. Uh, sorry, but um, yeah. Christina, I would just just call your local fishing game. They'll connect you with somebody that's a that's a that probably does what Jeff does. They go around, they speak to groups, and and they probably have that that teaching desire. You'll you'll find somebody with 
with one or two phone calls, is my guess. There'll be an old retired guy somewhere that wants to tell stories. <laughs> Great. All right. Any other questions? Comments from the peanut gallery. Thank you. Um, that's that's an elevation in status. <laughs> no, I'm happy. This is very informative. Thank you very much. Oh, you this bet. Is, Thank you. Oh, you helped. Yeah. All right. Well, we've, we've kept people long enough. Thanks for thanks for your guys' attention and, and uh, thank you, Jeff, for for showing up and helping us oh, out. We yeah. really appreciate you it. Bet. Um, just just love the partnership we have. A lot of our sportsmen's groups really do work together well and. Um, just give uh, Jeff's group uh, uh, a plug here to Montana Sportsmen for Fish and Wildlife. They do a lot of great work and uh, a lot of predator management around uh, Western Montana, and, and that's pretty key too. So we we like working with other groups that are that are like minded. Really appreciate yeah. all your help here, Jeff. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and uh, end the recording here, and then we will uh, end this meeting. So. We'll see you guys next week. We'll talk about um, uh, fair chase ethics and the history of wildlife conservation. We'll have Everett Headley with us next week. He is um, one of the instructors for the Master Hunter Program in Montana. And uh, I really look forward to hearing what he has to say too. So look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thank you so much.